What's up, everybody? My name is Robbie Rowland, and you are listening to The Robbie Rose Show, episode 75 with my boy Toby over there at Bat Flip Crazy. Let's hear a soundbite from Toby regarding Trevor Bauer. He's an example of a guy who like maybe doesn't have, the, you know, at least that's the narrative, right? He doesn't necessarily have like the physique. He doesn't necessarily have you know, what you would call like the natural uh, ability. But what he's been able to do is understand the game better than anybody else. What's going on, everybody, and welcome to The Robbie Rowe Show. I am your host, Robbie Rowland. You are listening to episode 75, and I have a guest today on the show who is almost, uh, I guess I guess we can put him in the same category as me as far as being a baseball geek, a baseball nerd. It's funny. Um, this is going to be... I don't want to say it's going to be like a fantasy baseball episode in particular because um, I wanted to bring him on the show because he speaks volumes to all of like the data and the statistics in the game today. And selfish motive, uh, I will I will add is there's a lot of like statistics out there that even I will like look at and be like, what does that mean? How do I? How can I put that into context? You know, what what is it? What is that actually telling me? And uh, just having him on the show is funny because like I was taking I was taking notes uh, for the podcast itself when I was talking to him, but I was also taking like side notes for myself too regarding like some of the metrics that he has uh, for an example. But um, we actually came into contact via Twitter. Uh, he's doing some fantastic stuff on his Twitter account. Uh, if you want to take a look at uh, some of the stuff he's doing, Twitter, if you're a user or if, if you're not, it doesn't matter. Um, just search Bat Flip Crazy. I'll make sure to link all of his, all of his stuff in the show notes. Um, there's a few things that I want to link in the show notes um, regarding this episode in particular. There's obviously his social accounts. He's got a Twitter uh, where he's most active. He's got a website, and he's also got a podcast where uh, he said his podcast is mostly you know, fantasy baseball related. Um, I'm definitely going to go check that out to see if I can't uh, up my – up my game because I'm doing like for those of you who follow me on other platforms, like I'm doing a lot of these breakdowns on my website, you know, like pitcher breakdowns. I, I mean, they're just so fun to do, like taking a deep dive into all the data analytics and all the statistics that are out there. Um, and uh, I need to, I need to, I think I need to understand it a little bit more, honestly. Like I know, I know this, the metrics that I use when I was playing, but I think there's just, you know, we even allude to it on the show. There's just new stuff coming out all the time. And uh, you'll hear it today. Like we totally geek out over over some of the stuff that we can really like. He uses the term "under the hood," like what's under the hood as far as like a player goes. Um, and it, and it's so cool just to get like that side of things, right? Um, because my whole goal is like being providing like a bridge for you guys from the performance standpoint. Uh, you know, the instruction side of the game, and then this you know, statistical side of the game and, and hopefully, you know, along the way that I can be the bridge that understands both sides and can apply that information and knowledge, um, to better equip you guys. Right. That's the, that's the whole goal. Um, so in the show notes, I want to, I want to link a few breakdowns that I have personally done on my website. And, uh, so you guys can go back and check that out and maybe get a better understanding after you listen to this podcast, um, some of the terminology that's used in those breakdowns. I'll also include the, we talk about, um, the, the pitcher list podcast I had on Nick Pollock from pitcher list. He's another guy that, uh, is a fellow baseball geek, if you will. I had him on the show. I want to say a few months back, I'll link that in the show notes. Um, and as We'll also link one of his tweets regarding Trevor Bauer. I think we talk about it uh, into into pretty good detail um, in this episode. So, yeah, it was a pleasure having Toby on. It was a pleasure geeking out with him. I highly encourage all you other baseball geeks to to go check him out. Like I said, all of the links for his stuff will be in the show notes as well. 
And yeah, so we, we, we dive into like his background in baseball and, and how he kind of got started, you know, developing a website. It, it's, he's got a funny, interesting story into how it all came into fruition. But then we talk about, you know, like I said, we dive into the, the statistics of things and, and the more, I guess, not well-known statistics that are out there, you know, really like taking a deep dive into that talk about dissecting like a pitcher, right? Like if he's creating a fantasy baseball team, what are some of the things that he looks at that can, you know, not necessarily like determine success or failure, but give us a better understanding of predictions, I guess, moving forward. Um, I definitely find his breakdowns of like a Noah Syndergaard and Trevor Bauer in this podcast episode very uh, very intriguing because it gives me a totally different outlook as well, you know, because like we have this we have this idea looking at, say, like an MLB.com statistics thing where we see these guys at the top. And then like he like uh, Toby kind of alludes to as far as taking a, a look under the hood and seeing what's really out there. And uh, we all, I also ask him like what his opinion is as far as like the most important stats that he looks at, like the most important metrics that he looks at when determining um, a pitcher. We don't really speak too much on the hitting side of things. It was funny we got done with the we got done with the interview, and um, we even said like, dude, we just spent forty minutes talking strictly like pitching. We didn't even go into the hitting side, but uh, no, there's a lot of good stuff in here. Um, a lot of breakdowns as far as like the metrics goes, statistics goes, and like I said, the two the two main pitchers that we focused on were Noah Syndergaard and, and Trevor Bauer. Um, with some other guys there sprinkled in, but uh, yeah, guys, I I think like I said, this is a this is a really cool episode for me just to to sit here and talk to him and, and kind of learn myself. So I I, uh, I encourage you guys if you are fellow baseball nerds, baseball geeks, to uh, to take some notes and maybe get a better understanding for like I said the the future breakdowns that I do because the more that I do those breakdowns on my page and I, and I'll link those in the show notes as well. I want to take those deep dives and I, I want to really get in depth with those because I'm I'm the worst. I think you guys know by now. Like I'm such a perfectionist. It's it's sickening. But all right, that's all I got. Um, I don't know what else I should say here, but yeah. So enjoy the show and uh, I appreciate you guys. Hope you guys are having a great day and I hope this podcast makes your day even better. I question mark. I don't know. All right, guys, enjoy episode seventy five, the Robbie Rowe show. Let's get to it. All right. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. The Robbie Rose Show. We got episode 75. I got my boy Toby here. We're going to totally geek out over some uh, some baseball analytics, data analytics, if you will. Toby, how you doing today, man? I'm doing great, Robbie. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So episode 75, uh, who is the first uh, baseball player that comes to your mind when you hear 75? <sighs> 75 I, I i didn't even like think to to prepare you for this but like sometimes oh, if, a, if a number comes up i'm like oh 75 man 75 i got i got one yeah well we're ba- i'm a bay one? area guy so it's got to be zito oh zito i knew it i saw a picture <laughs> on the mound ready to throw the ball i just couldn't name it yeah with the long That's... hair and the leg kick Oh man, just doing yoga, man. Just doing yoga, yeah, yeah. No, I was a, I was a Zito guy. Big big A's fan when they were really good. Nasty curveball. Oh yeah. Well, I wish that was a guy that that would be interesting to see his data analytics. Right? I don't even know if we have that. Oh man, I we I'll have to look into that afterwards. I, yeah, I was gonna say like that might be because like when did I want to say like uh, Statcast era was what tw- 2016 or 2015. I think 2015 is the first Statcast data, but we might be able to check out um, like his Fangraphs page and see see what it was all about because they often have data going back to like the mid 2000s. I think, dude, um, some of the in depth stuff. Yeah, you can actually get a decent amount here, like swinging strike rate, uh, all of that jazz. So uh, very interesting stuff. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm pumped to have you on, man, just because like. I'm going to go ahead and say it. I didn't want to because I want like my audience sometimes to perceive me as like all knowing, but I got I got I got to go ahead and say it. There's a lot of these data analytic metrics, dude, that I'm just like, what the heck is that? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, are, I, how I, I want to take take us back, man. Like, what is what is the background story into why you are so passionate about all of this? Yeah, well, I um, I grew I grew up around baseball. My dad was a high school baseball coach. Um, all of us played 
played baseball. So I've always really loved and appreciated the game. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't follow it for a few years. And then I really got back into it playing fantasy baseball Mm -hmm. because of it. Like I love, I love the statistics in baseball. Like, you know, we've heard all of the cliches, like it's a game of inches, you know, it's a game of percentages. It's a game of failure. And like, but it really, because of the number of like, uh, events that happen, right? Like pitches that are thrown, games that are played. It really lends itself a lot to data and analytics. And so that's kind of what re-inspired my love for baseball. And over the last like two or three years, I, you know, I started a website and I, I have a podcast and got onto Twitter. But even for the last like 10 to 15 years, I've just loved playing fantasy baseball. And that's what kind of inspired, reignited my love for the game. Yeah, and I, I'll make sure for those of you who are listening, I'll Toby, I'll link all of your stuff into the show notes, man. So, um, so my my audience can can uh, be sure to go check all your stuff out, dude. And it was funny, I went to your website, and I think in like your your bio of your website, it was something to do with like your wife encouraging you to start start up all of that stuff because of of how much like a nerd and out you were doing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, it, like if my if my wife hadn't suggested uh, that I that I create the web like the website, I would have never done it because I used to spend like hours just on fan graphs, like you know, looking up all of these different analytics. And she was like, you know, you spend a lot of your time like doing this research. And she's super supportive of like going after my passion. And so she was like, you know, you should share that. Like, you seem to be pretty good. You seem to win a decent amount. And so like, get out there and kind of share this information and really opened the world to me because I wasn't on Twitter. Like I didn't follow a lot of the folks who are doing analytics and you can learn so much by kind of watching folks who, who know what they're talking about and learning about how they analyze players and um, how they play the game from a strategy perspective. So um, I all, all credit due to my wife for really pushing me to, to get myself out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a rule. Number one, make sure you give the wife the, the credit. I, I respect that. Um, so, so that's funny, man. So it started out with just fantasy baseball and then this passion for like, okay, I gotta, I gotta get the edge, right? Like the competitive edge, like what are people not seeing outside looking in that I could potentially dive into to give me like that edge. You want to, you want to dive into this, you know, the fan graphs, like we mentioned before to give you that competitive edge in your fantasy league so what was that looking like as far as your your first start into to diving into these analytics when you started a couple years back like what were the some of the statistics that you were looking at as far as giving uh giving yourself an advantage to pick you know certain players over certain other players yeah so first like it all started with fan graphs like fan graphs graphs really revolutionized my understanding of the game And so, you know, there's been some metrics that they've had around for a long time. But like when you think about uh, like, let's just say with a pitcher, like the things that you're thinking about are kind of walks, strikeouts, quality of contact that folks are giving up. And so with pitchers, there are there are metrics like uh, O swing, for instance, which is chase rate. So like what are the percentage of pitches outside the zone that a pitcher gets hitters to swing at? Uh, you also have like first pitch strike rate, zone percentage, so the percentage of pitches in the zone, percentage of first pitch strikes, and those like are kind of control metrics that give you a sense of you know like how well uh, a pitcher is getting people to swing at pitches outside the zone or like throwing the ball over the plate. Uh, strikeout metrics like swinging strike rate, which is you know the percentage of pitches uh, that a pitcher gets a matter to swing and miss on completely. And then like uh, in zone contact rate, which is kind of like, you know, on pitches inside the zone, how often a batter swings and uh, and doesn't make contact, which is a really good sign of dominance. Because if you can throw the ball in the strike zone and get people to swing and miss, then, you know, that's a really great start. So those are kind of like where I start off on. And then uh, StatCast really revolutionized, I think, understanding of like uh, quality of contact metrics. So. Uh, being able to look at folks to see like how often do they give up quality of contact, both in terms of, you know, exit velocity, launch angle, uh, things of that nature. Right. Uh, and then there's, um, you know, there's also like just some, some broader metrics that I always go to, like strike out minus walk rate, which just gives you a good sense of like, you know, um, how well a pitcher does, that's probably the best like single metric to analyze. And then there are some luck related ones like, or not luck necessarily, but uh, with today's metrics, you yeah. can see what you're not like Babbitt and, and strand rate, things like that. So 
um, there's like, there's a ton of metrics to really get into it and, and geek out. And it just depends on like, you know, uh, who the player is like hitter, pitcher, um, what, what is going to be the most effective way to, to analyze them. Yeah. So I, I, I hate to put you on the spot like this, but it just like popped into my head. Like, are there any pitchers, uh, per se that like over the past recent years that you have kind of dove into and like looked at the underlying like statistic metrics that you were just talking about and maybe the general population uh, like the general baseball population would look at this guy and say oh he's like he's having a bad year or he's having a down year he's not doing well and like these statistics that you're you're speaking of like they were really good so therefore maybe his year isn't as bad as people perceive it like is there anyone that jumps off the uh, on top of your head like that um guys who have been doing uh who have kind of underperformed their metrics um it happens kind of uh um you know year to year like a lot of times what i would do more broadly is kind of take a look at so there are um what i really love are expected metrics so Mm -hmm. like if you go to baseball savant they have something like that Mm -hmm. expected woba um and so that's like combine strikeouts walks and then the quality of contact that a player might have and so that um and that tells you like kind of what their expected performance might be and then you can compare that to um you know uh how they're actually performing so like an example of that might be um for somebody who was uh really unlucky uh last year so if i just go to baseball savant Mm -hmm. uh, since um and i take a look at you know, guys who have had uh, a ton of plate appearances last year who may have uh, underperformed. So, uh, like last year, some of the guys who had who were the biggest underperformers were um, somebody like uh, Her- like Herman Marquez is an example. Oh yeah, uh, Verlander. Uh, so Marquez actually did really well over the course of the season. He had that elite second half. Um, but when you look at him, kind of year uh, year over year. Like his expected uh, weighted on base average, um, league average is 315. His was 281, but his actual weighted on base average was around 300. So it's still better than league average, but not necessarily kind of the elite uh, number that you would mention. Uh, a guy that jumps out to me right now uh, is Noah Syndergaard. Okay. He pitched okay. super well um, in his last start, um, but before then there was like an 80-point gap between his – uh, expected WOBA and his actual WOBA. Um, so he was like, um, uh, his, uh, his expected WOBA was like 281, which is, which is like 40 points better than league average. Mm-hmm. Um, his actual WOBA was three, six, three sixty one. but there was like about an 80 point difference there. And that's an example of a guy just by looking at that one metric where I might be able to say, you know, hey, um, you know, here's a guy who is going to be pitching better. Like, don't worry too much. And you can do that kind of like a surface level analysis of it, but then you can actually dive into the individual numbers. So when you look at his uh, strikeout metric, like they're fairly in line with where they've been in the past couple years. His control metrics are actually better than they have been in previous years. And so just by looking at that data, I can look at Noah Sandergaard and say, hey, you know, in fantasy baseball, this is a guy that I might want to buy low on because people are like, ah, he's struggling. You know, he's not meeting expectations. But when you look under the hood, there's actually a lot of numbers there that are kind of pointing towards him being a a better player than you might uh, otherwise um, expect from the performance that you've seen so far. Yeah. So when you say that, I, I know you kind of already briefly explained the WOBA statistic, but when it comes to those expected statistics, if you can like break that down for my audience, like a little bit more. So like what actually goes into the metrics to determine like, uh, like what, what gets thrown in there to determine an expected statistic? If that is, if that makes any sense in the world. <laughs> oh yeah. It makes a ton of sense. Yeah. So with uh, expected WOBA, essentially what they're looking out is strikeouts and walks and then they're looking at quality of contact. And for baseball savant, generally speaking, most of their quality of contact or expected metrics uh, involve launch angle and uh, exit velocity. I got so, you. What, so essentially what they do is they have access to all of these batted balls. And so they'll take all of those batted balls and they'll say, OK, every single batted ball that was hit at, you know, 95 miles per hour at uh, 24 
degree launch angle has produced this result, like, you know, a 350 batting average, a 500 slug. And so we're going to expect every other batted ball that's hit that way to kind of fit into that. And that's what we're going to assume is going to happen with the batted ball. So as we know, like, there are so many different things that factor into it, right? Like whether a batter is being shifted or not, um, exactly where they hit it in terms of spray angle. So horizontal launch angle, mm-hmm. the park that they're in, right? All of those factor into what actually happens. With the ball. But uh, as a sample size gets larger, you would expect that, 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 that um, uh, the batted balls to kind of fit into uh, the expected metrics. And so early on in a season, it's really nice in fantasy baseball because you have these huge outliers, right? Like Noah Syndergaard, you know, have like an 80 point difference between what the expected metric might have thought he should be doing versus what he was actually doing. By the end of the year, the biggest differences will be like maybe 20 and th- or 30 points between players. But this is an opportunity like early on, people respond really uh kind of emotionally to poor performance or really good performance. And they think that it's going to continue forever. And so this might be an example where you can leverage that and knowledge of that statistic, understand what you might expect from somebody moving forward, either buy low or, you know, sell high on a guy, which is much more easier said than done in fantasy baseball. Uh, but that might be an example of how you can use these small sample sizes to your advantage. Yeah, and it's tough for me, too, because, like, I look at it from, like, a player's aspect, too, where I look at stuff, right? So, like, mm-hmm. is there anything in the statistic metric of, like, expected results to to determine um, or, like, include their repertoire? Because, like, I look at a guy like Syndergaard, who obviously, like, you look at his data analytics for his pitches, and it's like he's he's very superior. Like, is that ever included into those expected, or is it just results-based? So um, it's it's not included in that expected metric. Um, and so that's the thing that I think is really great about the data analytics is like, you know, you can't really use just one um, one metric. Like you have to use yeah. all of the metrics that are at your disposal to kind of gauge like, you know, oh, Syndergaard's like, you know, he's getting hit. He's getting hit really hard so far. You've got to see whether he ex- the expected metrics line up with it. But then you also have to look at, okay, like his strikeout metrics may look like this or his walk metrics may look like that. But there's also levels, I think, of, of luck and small sample size variance that goes into that, too. But with a guy like Syndergaard, what I might do is, you know, want to get a sense of, okay, like uh, what is um, uh, what is his uh, how how is he doing overall? Um, so like, I'll just take a, take a really quick look at his page. So like his swinging strike rate is 11.9%. That's better than league average. League average is around 11%. It's not as good as maybe he's been doing, um, you know, in the past. But then when I look at some of the other strikeout related metrics, like his in zone contact rate is down 5%, which means he's throwing the ball in the zone and batters are swinging, you know, he's 5% better than league average right now, whereas last year and even previous years, he was right around league average. So that's going to gonna tell me that, you know, OK, well, he's like dominating folks in the zone. You know, that's important. He's also throwing has his highest first pitch strike rate, um, his, his highest zone rate in two years. Um, so he's throwing the ball in the zone, too. So I would expect his walk metrics to be better than last year. Mm-hmm. And when I take it, take a look at something like called plus swing strike rate is this great metric that essentially takes all the called strikes and all the swinging strikes and adds them together as a percent of pitches. Um, Pitcher List, which is a really great le- resource, and a guy named Alex Fast there has done some. Yeah, he's been on the show. Uh, What's that? I, I, had, uh, I had Nick Pollock on the show. Uh, oh, you did? Yeah, okay. With, yeah. yeah, he's cool. Yeah. He does a yeah, great so job of like, it. They, they're super, they're great at looking at like pitchers, but also hitters. Like they have a great staff that works on these things. And Alex recently did an article that essentially looked at how predictive is called plus strike uh, rate. So essentially called strikes plus swinging strike rates divided by pitches and actually found a lot of folks have used swinging strike rate as kind of like a really strong metric. But actually the data tells us that called plus swinging strikes is a better metric at predicting strikeouts in the future. And so that's what I've been kind of going to now that I know that information. And we're learning new things every single day. But 
you look at Syndergaard, you know, league average is about 27.3% for pitchers, and he's at 30.1%. And so anything above 30% is elite. And so with a guy like Syndergaard, I'd be like, okay, so his, his batted ball quality is telling me that he's been lucky. He's been unlucky on batted balls in play, but all of the metrics are telling me, you know, his walk rate should be down because the control metrics are better. Uh, the strikeout rate should maybe be, you know, at or even a little bit above where it's been in the past uh, because he's demonstrating elite called plus swinging strike rate and he's being able to dominate in the zone. And as a result of all of that information, I'd be really comfortable to say that Syndergaard's going to be really good moving forward and that he would be a guy that you'd want to kind of go after in your fantasy baseball league. Now, there's always like there's always new things that happen, new developments. And like this year, the ball is a huge development because the ball it's not necessarily like juiced. We use the term juiced a lot, but like the research that a guy named Rob Arthur has done, who has been able to predict whether the ball is uh, is juiced or not each year, is essentially like the the drag on the ball. Mm-hmm. Is so there's something with the seams a little different making it, it making it uh, go a little bit further. Right. And as a result, like the home run per fly ball rate is already up 2% this year. And generally it's down earlier in the year when the weather's colder. So that might be something where you'd want to think about like how that might impact a, a guy like Cindergard. Um, is he a guy who gives up a lot of fly balls and he's not, he's a high ground ball pitcher, but I wouldn't be as concerned about that with Cindergard. And so he'd be a guy where I would like wholeheartedly be, you know, he's struggling so far this year, but I think he's going to be really good when all is said and done. That's so cool, That's man. So There's cool. so many different, like, lenses to look through. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, it's like, a, like, like you said, it's like a full-time job to pick this fantasy baseball team and, like, understand, like, <laughs> who's going to do what. And, and, again, like, it goes back to trying to predict, like, sports performance is, is like, it's, it's fit, almost impossible. Right. You just can't. Yep. There's so many variables that go into it, you know, and and all we're, we're talking about, like on field performance. But like, obviously, there's, you know, me coming from like the baseball aspect of it. There's things that like off the field can affect you and all that other stuff, too. Um, so do you dive like when when you're looking at, say, like a guy, um, you know, I talked a little bit about before the show, like, say, we, we wanted to like dive into a Trevor Bauer case. Right. And. Mm-hmm. When you're looking at a guy and you're you're determining all of these other metrics that you we've talked about here in the past, are you looking at like his pitch data analytics to determine like how quality of his stuff is as well? Like moving forward, is that like another lens that you look at basically saying, you know, like throw all of the, you know, like the luck metrics that you have out of it and just purely look at like the pitcher's stuff. So therefore you kind of like dissect, okay. You know, forcing fastball is this. It's spinning at this. It's got this launch angle. It's it's got this percentage of barrel contact in the zone. Are are you like diving into all of that stuff as well when when looking at a pitcher? Um, I, I do. I do. I look at I look at stuff a lot. So one of the things I think that changes the most for pitchers, like on just a start to start basis, and I think this is one of the really challenging things about like analyzing pitchers is pitch mix, right? Like. Pitchers have good pitches. They have pitches that aren't so good. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's only a couple guys who have, you know, four or five elite pitches, right, perform across the board better. But their utilization of those pitches can change dramatically from one start to another. And this is one where I think, like, understanding real baseball, um, and that's one of my limitations. Like, I, I, I know baseball, but I don't know it. Like, I'm not a coach. Right. I'm not deep in that. And so one of the things that I always like wonder is there are guys who throw like literally their like the fastball is terrible or their sinker is terrible. We're seeing sinkers being thrown left and left and left. Yeah. They generally get crushed and they don't generate whiffs. Mm-hmm. And so like it's really interesting to me, like a guy who may have a really terrible fastball and a really good breaking ball, but assists insists on throwing that fastball, you know, 50, 60 percent of the time even when it's getting, when it's getting crushed and there might be a reason, right? Like you can't get the zone or, you know, whatever it is, but that's always fascinating to me. Uh, Trevor Bauer is actually a really interesting. I was just going to say like, he's kind of exactly what you're talking about, right? With his four seam. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so he's super interesting because like, I love, I love, uh, I love Trevor Bauer for a, a, a few reasons. Like as a, as a, as a baseball player, number one, like, I'm a huge fan of driveline and what they're doing. And just like, 
you know, I listen to their podcasts and I try to like digest what they're putting out there and yes. like understand that and apply it to fantasy baseball as much as possible. And I know they'd probably like vomit hearing me say that because like, <laughs> they, they could care less about like fantasy baseball. Right. And, and Trevor Bauer said that like repeatedly, but he's super interesting because like, he's an example of a guy who like maybe doesn't have the, you know, at least that's the narrative, right? He doesn't necessarily have like the physique. He doesn't necessarily have, you know, what you would call like the natural uh, ability, but what he's been able to do is understand the game better than anybody else realize what his strengths are and like kind of um, and maximize those strengths as much as possible. Right. And so a guy like Bauer is really interesting. I actually got a ton of heat or not a ton of heat, you know, it's all like relatively like I put out a tweet earlier this week about how Bauer really like he's been performing really, really well. The outcomes have been good. If you look under the hood, it's actually not as good as last year. So like, you know, he's getting uh, uh, hitters to, to chase fewer pitches outside the zone He's throwing fewer first pitch strike rate or he has he's throwing uh, fewer first pitch strikes. And and all of those things are correlated to walk percentage. Right. And we know that he's he's walked a ton of guys this year. I think he's like over five walks for nine right now. Uh, yeah, when you look yeah. at his um, his strikeout stuff, like it's still pretty good. But, um, you know, it's not necessarily as dominant as he was towards the end of last year. But what he's been able to do is is his BABIP, his his uh, batting average on balls in play, is at 221, which is way below league average. League average is 290. You might expect a guy like him to get. Uh, he's 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 been pretty consistent at generating, where at least last year, like since he's had the good stuff, yeah, uh, yeah. lower BABIPs. But then his strand rate, league average is like 72.7 percent. His strand rate, the number of, of runners he's leaving on base, is at 84.4 is pretty unsustainable. Um, so, you know, it's likely that he's going to regress if the skills continue. Like his his expected WOBA is 324, where his WOBA is 266. So he'd be a guy that you'd expect to go down. But what I find really interesting about him is like his pitch mix this year is very different, right? Yeah, yeah, last, yeah. Year, last year, he worked on that Corey Kluber slider um, and it was a dominant pitch, 21.1% swinging strike rate on that pitch. 45.6% uh, O swing. So, you know, on half of his pitches about outside the zone, he was getting hitters to chase on that. That pitch has been almost as good this year, 21.7% swinging strike rate. He's not getting people to chase as much, but he's not throwing that, that pitch as much. And I think that's because he's, you know, trying to work on that changeup. Yeah. He talked about how he was, how he was developing a changeup in the off season and he's throwing that pitch it's the third most uh, consistent pitch that he's throwing this year. Um, whereas last year, that was the fifth most common pitch he was throwing. Um, but this year, the changeup actually hasn't been that good. 10.5% swinging strike rate compared to 15% last year. Uh, it's getting about the same uh, chase rate. And so that might be why his swinging strike rate is actually down a little bit. is because he's not getting people to chase on it. But he's fascinating because like, you know, for him, like I think for him, the process is the outcomes are important, but the process is really important for him as well. And so he's probably committed to the process of working on this pitch and getting it to be as effective as possible because he knows that's going to make him a better pitcher in the long run. Right. So right. He's, he's sticking with it right now. Um, his curveball is also much worse than last year. And why that is, I'm not exactly sure, but its swinging strike rate is down 8%. So that's what I might look at to figure out, like, why is Trevor Bauer's swinging strike rate down a little bit from last year? Why is his chase rate down from last year? And so that all of those things kind of combined would tell me that that might be a reason why those things are down. And then I've got to figure out whether that's something that might stick or might not stick. With a guy like Bauer, like, I love Bauer. He was my sixth rated starting pitcher and of all starting pitchers heading into the season. I think he's going to be really, really good all the reasons i articulated mm -hmm. but you know, he's not pitching as well right now and i think that's something that he would probably acknowledge himself and i'd be interested to even get like his idea of like why that might be whether or not he'd care to share that or not i'm not sure is, is his curveball his third most pitch uh, third most thrown pitch or is it his fourth his curve it's actually his second most thrown okay um, so last year um i don't have the percentages in front of me i have like the bulk totals right. just because they don't all show you can actually check this out like on fangraphs player pl player pages if you go to the splits tab 
uh, they have a pitch type splits and it'll give you like all of the, um, all of the data on every single one of his uh, pitches, like swinging strike rate, uh, chase rate, in zone contact rate. You can also look at the WRC plus against it. There's like a ton of stuff that you can um, see uh, through that. But when we look at the percentage of pitches, his fastball usage is up 5% from last year. His changeup usage is up 6%. His slider usage is down 2%. His curveball usage, usage is actually down um, about 13%, um, which is interesting um, because it hasn't been as effective of a pitch. But right. you know, he's got so many pitches, he doesn't throw one you know, an overwhelming amount of the time outside of that fastball. And it's funny too, because his fastball statistically speaking is like his worst pitch. And I think he's come out publicly and said that, like, if you look at his mm-hmm. fastball data analytics, like he's in the dead zone, as far as spin rate, I want to say it's like 2200 or something. Um, but it, it gets barreled the most, the batting average against it, I want to say is in the three hundreds. Um, I don't have that in front of me. I just, from, from what like I nerd out about on, a, on occasion, but, um, but then you look at like the, you know, the general just MLB.com stats. And I think he's leading the league in batting average against like as a whole, um, not just the fastball, but like as a whole, I think he's like number one and hitters are hitting um, like one, I don't know, like 167 off of him. I think it was. <laughs> and like, that's a statistic that like for me as a pitcher, um, kind of going like on a, on a different tantrum here, but like as a pitcher, I'm like worried about, a couple different things like throw ERA, throw wins and losses out the, out the window. I think we kind of know that nowadays, but like how, how hard are hitters hitting off of me? Right. So like the, the exit velo, um, exit velo average, or, um, what would you say earlier? It was like a barrels statistic. Uh, yeah. So there's like expected WOBA and then there's also uh, barrels per plate appearance and barrels per bat- batted ball event. Yeah, so it's like as a pitcher, like those are the types of things that we should look at, right? Like, I mean, how hard are hitters hitting off of me, and um, like, what is the average that hitters are hitting off of me, right? Like, and 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 for me, like looking at a guy like Bauer, that's obviously something that sticks out, and it's uh, you know, I, I don't know if it's it's attainable. I don't know what his statistics were last year, but um, you know, it's it's funny like looking at that and going, okay, well, if hitters are hitting like 167 off of them, that means he's he's doing something right. And then we take, we like you said, we take a look under the hood, and we determine like, okay, well, this can be better, this can be better. And I think you're right, man. I think as a, as a pitcher, too, it's like we're so focused on big picture all the time that it's like, okay, what can I do, um, you know, for the first half of this season to better myself in the long run? And, like, he's come out publicly and said, like, he's always had, you know, a pitch going on this axis that goes this way. And, and then he developed that slider that goes in on lefties away from righties. And then he was like, well, I don't really have a weapon that I could use that pitches that, that goes off my two-seam fastball, right? So the one that comes back. And, uh, and now that he's developed that, um, you know, who knows? Maybe he, he flips a page and says, okay, I'm comfortable with this. Like, let's back pocket it now when I need it. And, and, and then let's go. Um, but that's, it's just so fascinating to me, man, to see, like hear all of these dang metrics and be like, wow, there's so much more that, that, that goes into it. Um, what are, uh, what are like your go-tos? I know we've talked about a lot of like statistics, but what are your yep. go-to statistics that you can constantly go to, to pretty much give you a, a really good under underlying, uh, fact on, um, say like a, we'll stick with pitchers too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, and to your point about Bauer and his, like, uh, his, his average, you know, against like, that's why I wouldn't trust necessarily batting average against like Bauer. He's giving up, um, you know, he's 201st out of, uh, pitchers right now on the leaderboard for baseball savant on barrels. He's given up 10 barrels already at a 5.3% barrels per batter. Can you, can you break that statistic down? So it's, So it's 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 yeah, batted so. balls events, right? And then you come up with like a percentage based on the the type of event it is. Yeah. So uh, essentially, a barrel. Uh, I hope I'm I hope I'm getting this right. But a barrel is essentially any combination of exit velocity and launch angle that results in an average of 500 or higher and a slugging percentage of 25 uh, or uh, two. Uh, two uh, at 2,500 or higher. Um, so essentially like anything, any batted ball that has an average, uh, um, uh, batting average of 500 or higher and is, uh, better than a double essentially on average. So like essentially your best 
quality of contact. So, you know, you're talking about like the best types of launch angle with really high exit velocity right. and right. generally like extra base hits. So as a pitcher, you want to stay away from barrels. As a hitter, you want to hit barrels. Right. So like when you right. think about like power hitter, like Joey, Joey Gallo, right. he's always right. among the league leader in, in those. But there's different metrics. There's per batter faced, so essentially per plate appearance, and then there's per batted ball event. Um, I generally use the per batter faced because, you know, for batted ball events, like somebody like a Bauer who strikes out a ton of guys, you know, he doesn't give up that many uh, balls in play. So, you know, he might have a higher. It's going to be skewed. Uh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So I use batters faced and per plate appearance. But like an example for Bauer is that he is giving up a lot of, or at least relatively speaking, compared to last year, a lot more uh, higher quality of contact. So I think that's where you you get into the expected Woba being so much worse is what he's probably had is he's had a bunch of balls that should be doubles or home runs that maybe he got caught at the warning track or, yeah. you know, uh, 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 players were positioned in the right place. Like I remember he played the Mariners like a few um, games ago yeah. and there was like two or three batted balls that were absolutely crushed, but they were like right at out. <laughs> I love those ones. <laughs> yeah. As a pitcher, you're like, yeah, hey, it's the same thing as that little pop-up. Exactly. Um, yeah, totally. So, uh, so that's a little bit of a tangent, but, um, yeah. So like if I'm looking at a pitcher, like essentially what I want to do and like, it's really hard for me to get down. If you want to look for one metric, like I think the best metric single metric to look at how a pitcher is performing is their K minus walk rate. Like, cause that just boils down for you. Like if a guy walks a ton of players, it's bad. If he strikes out a ton of players, it's good. And generally speaking, most pitchers will rest on like a, a general within average continuum of the quality of contact. That they give up. There are certain guys like a good example of a guy is like Nick Pavetta. Nick Pavetta had all these metrics and everybody was like, Oh, he's going to be great this year. Like, you know, he's got a really high swinging strike rate. He's got a really high K minus walk rate, but he's never been able to have a league average BABIP. And he always has given up on home runs. Mm-hmm. And like in the past we would have said, Oh, he's just unlucky. But we know we know better than that, right? Now we have like we can look and see that he gives up a ton of barrel. We can see that he's thrown like eighteen hundred fastballs in his career, and his BABIP against on fastballs is like three sixty. So like you know um, that would be an example of a guy who like has a, an extreme batted ball quality issue. You know, on the other side of the equation, um, you might look at a guy like um, uh, Syndergaard actually, or Jacob Degrom, where. Uh, routinely because they throw with such high velocity because they don't give up a ton of fly balls. They generally have uh, better uh, than league average batted ball. Quality. So that might like be an example. DeGrom has struggled a little bit with home runs, but like last year they were two of the best guys when it came to managing in quality of contact. So if you want just one metric that K minus walk rate, but what I essentially do is I break it down into like, if you want to find out like whether a guy's walk rate makes sense or whether they should have a high or low or about league average walk rate, I take a look at the chase rate, right? If you get players to chase on pitches outside the zone, then, you know, like you're going to have a lower walk rate. First pitch strike rate is correlated very strongly with walk rate. So if you get ahead of hitters, like, you know, you get them to chase more, you get to get into your breaking stuff, your off speed stuff, and then you have to throw the ball in the zone. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and like the chase rate actually helps to offset the zone rate. So like, if you can get players to chase on pitches outside the zone, you don't have to throw the ball in the zone that much, which is a really good thing. Like a guy like um, uh, Matsuhiro Tanaka always has a really, really high chase rate. And as a result, like he doesn't have to throw the ball in the zone and he always has a really good low walk rate. Uh, for strikeout rate, like I mentioned, swinging strike rate, this is all available at fan graphs. Mm-hmm. Um, called plus swinging strike rate, that's available. Uh, you can do a little search on, um, on Baseball Savant to get that statistic. Um, that's really good because there are guys like Steven Matz, like Kyle Hendricks, uh, like Aaron Nola, who routinely get very, very high percentage of their pitches called strikes. Right. So they may not get guys to swing and miss, uh, but they're fooling guys because their stuff is so good. And then in zone contact rate is a really good metric. Like if you look at the elite starting pitchers, they all have really good in zone or really bad in zone contact rates, like much better than league average. Because like they can throw the ball in the zone and still dominate hitters. 
And so those are kind of the things that I look at when I'm looking at quality of contact. Like I look at the expected WOBA metric, which is available on Baseball Savant and expected metrics. Um, I look at, uh, you know, their, their overall like um, batted ball profiles, so like what percentage of ground balls versus fly balls. Um, you know, the barrels I look at a little bit, although, you know, like with, with, uh, with, with pitchers, there are some pitchers that because they strike out enough guys and they don't walk guys, they can actually give up a decent amount of hard contact and have like a league average Babbitt and still, still be very successful because guys don't get off. So those are sort of like the metrics that I, that I look at. And then I'm always looking at yeah. like, yeah. like rolling average graphs on fan graphs to see like what their pitch mix looks like. Are they making changes in it? Is there a reason why their strikeout rate or their walkout rate have gone up or down based on how their different pitches are? You can like go so in depth on it. Like, but those oh, are I know. Yeah. Basic. Yeah, I, well, that's what that's the part I love about it, man. Is it's just one giant rabbit hole, <laughs> yeah. and I'll I'll do like my my breakdown blogs. Like for example, I did a Tyler Glass now breakdown, and like I went in, you know, um, pretty hard. He was he was another guy that I've played with him in, in the past and have done a podcast mm-hmm. with him. So it was cool, like diving into all of his metrics and then like finding something that like stuck out and was like, okay, let me look into this, and then finding another thing and then looking into that and so on and so forth. Um, so we're, I want to I want to wrap. Up up the show but there's one thing i i want to ask you and it's got to be it's got to be predictions and uh just to keep it brief we'll stick with like we'll stick with cy young al nl after basically like a month of the season who looks good um for you as far as al and nl cy young winners if i were to go for an al cy young war- winner through the first uh based on what i've seen i think the best pitcher in baseball um, at the end of the year is going to be Garrett Cole oh, yeah. of the Astros. I think that um, uh, everything about what he's doing, like he's he's given up, um, you know, his swinging strike rate is up. He gets folks to chase on pitches inside the zone. He dominates inside the zone. Um, his first pitch strike rate, like, isn't great so far, but he, in the past he's, he's had a really solid one. And he's just had a rough, uh, you know, he has a 60.1% uh, strand rate, which means that like, you know, essentially 13% higher than league average number of runners who get on base, um, you know, are, are scoring. And generally speaking, when you have a high strikeout rate, you know, his is 37.6% so far this year, right? He's got like, yeah. Um, you know, and, and then pitching with the Astros, like I just, I trust that organization. I trust what they're doing. And so I think when all is said and done, you know, he's going to be, I think he's going to win the Cy Young here once, once, once the luck in his favor, um, a little bit. Right. What, what, what do you got in the NL? Um, in the NL, uh, if I had to go with somebody, this is a little bit tough because like, I don't necessarily, uh, I don't necessarily trust like a lot of the guys in the NL who have been doing really well. (laughs) Um, so you know, I'll kind of let's go. I don't know. This it's probably too out far outside the box. Um, I love I mean, outside Scherzer the box. <laughs> Scherzer still, still looks really, really good, but a guy that I've just fallen, um, I've fallen in love with recently, just in looking at the numbers. Mm-hmm. And I don't think he's going to win the Cy Young, but is Caleb Smith of the Marlins? Wow, lefty, got it. So Caleb Smith of the Marlins, like, and kudos to everybody. I know like pitchers list has always been a huge fan. I know like Alex fast, I think Nick Pollock as well. Yeah. I've been huge fans of Caleb Smith, but when you look at his number, he has the highest swinging strike rate right now of any pitcher in baseball among qualified pitchers, which is a really, really good sign. Absolutely dominating in the zone. His in zone contact rate is 75%. And league average is around 85%. So 10%, like guys swinging inside the zone on pitches are only connecting on a quarter of those pitches. That's actually lower than the league average for all swings, like outside or inside the zone. And then he's getting folks to chase at a 37.7% rate, um, which is just that that leads the league too. So, you know, his first pitch strike rate is okay. He's in the zone about league average. And so he's getting folks to chase a ton on pitches outside the zone. 
like for me, that's just a recipe for absolutely awesome. And <laughs> is and is left on base rate like it's going to get worse. But his ERA right now is two. Yeah. Um, you know his his K minus walk rate is twenty six point nine percent. So like anything like around there is absolutely excellent. And then when you look at his pitches, his changeup is generating twenty four percent swinging strike rate, forty one point seven percent pace rate. His four seam fastball, right? So his fastball is generating a twelve point three percent swinging strike rate. His four seam fastball is generating a higher swinging strike rate than all of Trevor Bauer's pitches combined. Mm. His chase rate is also 29.5% on his four seam fastball, which is also better than all of Trevor Bauer's um, pitches combined. Dude, you just gave me something to do the rest of the day. <laughs> and that's not a criticism of Trevor Bauer because I think he's going to be, I think he may win the AL Cy Young once he gets everything you know, in order. Um, you know, because he, while he, the underlying metrics aren't as good, like he's been, he's been lucky so far. And so if he's good the rest of the season, it's gonna, it's gonna come out the water. But that just tells you how good Caleb Smith has been. And like, when I see something like that, um, then I'm like, you know, like, I just don't see a reason why he's going to struggle. Right. Um, you know, and so he may not be as good as he has been, but he's still been dominant and I think he can be dominant moving forward. Love it, dude. Well, Hey man, it's been an absolute pleasure, man. Um, go ahead and tell my audience where they can find you as far as your social media platforms go. Yeah, definitely. The best place to reach me, the place where I'm at most consistently is on Twitter. Uh, it's at Batflip crazy. Um, that's the best place to reach me. Why my website is batflipcrazy.com. I try to keep it as much as updated as possible, but a lot of my content I'm just sharing on Twitter. And then I got the podcast, which is uh, if you just search for Batflip Crazy um, on all of your podcast platforms. Got it. All right, um, dude. Thanks so much, man. That was a, that was a that was an absolute blast hearing all of that, dude. Um, I'm actually gonna have to go back and listen to it just to like write down all of these things. I've been like taking notes all episode, but uh, I appreciate your time, dude. And I'll sign you off off the air. All right. Thanks a lot, Robbie. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. All right, guys. That's another episode of The Robbie Rose Show in the books. I appreciate you guys for tuning in, being listeners. Um, I will link something in the show notes for those of you guys who stick around towards the end of the episode. I don't know how many of it is there are, but um, it's basically just a, an email list that I'm trying to, to kind of dabble with a little bit more. I'll link it in the show notes. It'll be under you know sign up for, for new content. I'm basically uh, trying to do anything and everything, really, to publish as much like baseball informative instructional content like i said i was doing those breakdowns um so a easier way for me to go about that is is if i can like have your guys's emails in regards to sending out you know weekly newsletters saying hey this is what i got this is why i think it's beneficial and uh let's dive in so if you want to go into the show notes of this episode i know i said that a lot today but uh go to the show notes and you'll see down towards the bottom of the page um, something saying register by clicking this link and that link will take you to a landing page in which you just enter your email address and your name and you also have a uh, section where you can include the type of content that you would like to see more of from me so go ahead and do that appreciate you guys have a good one